coming up on That Was a Show. High Society Was a Show. The year was 1995, and women all over New York City were winning publishing companies in divorce settlements. Such was the case with Dorothy Dot Emerson, played by Mary McDonnell. She published the trashy yet highly successful romance novels penned by her best friend Ellie Walker, played by Jean Smart. The show is pretty much just about the daily comings and goings of Dot and Ellie as they live it up as outrageously as possible amongst New York's high society scene. What did Elizabeth Taylor have to do with all of it? And what exactly was Liz Knight on CBS? Bryn, Aaron, and Barry put on their best black tie and jewelry, pop some champagne, and try to figure out why this show didn't get invited to any more parties. Plus, tune in to find out what they mean when they say that this show has major BWD energy. <laughs> we grew up during peak sitcom, Seinfeld, Friends, The Fresh Prince, but those shows were diamonds in the rough. This podcast is not about those diamonds. It's about the rough. Some sitcoms were briefly popular in their time. Some were canceled almost immediately. You probably won't recognize most of these, and you'll ask, that was a show? That was a show? The podcast about failed or forgotten sitcoms from the 80s and 90s, starring... Bryn Burney, Aaron Yeager, and Andrew Helmer as Barry. A Radio Gizmo production. <laughs> so, kick us off. He goes right into like radio voice, like yeah, he right does away, immediately. <laughs> right in, right into radio voice. Greetings and salutations to all of our fabulous listeners and you, friends. You are listening to <laughs> TWAS ninety nine point six. All bad sitcoms all the time. <laughs> yeah. With with interruptions for news and sports and weather updates. Traffic no, uh, on all. the. Uh, on the hour, what is it? On the hour, five minutes after the hour. <laughs> <laughs> no, none of that. None of that is no, happening. Not, we offer none of, none of those services. No, not at all. I could launch. We really the, bamboozled them. <laughs> I could launch the news app on my phone and read random headlines. Yeah. I, I I think I speak for everyone listening that nobody nobody's listening to this to hear about the fucking news. So yeah. let's. Uh, I mean, people listen to this to probably avoid the news and escape the news because. You know, the yeah. news is just a constant cycle of anxiety for all of us these We're days. We're about as far from relevancy as you can get. So yeah, let's... exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I mean, it's relevant in the sense that you know, we're looking at all these like old obscure sitcoms from a 2023 lens, yeah. but you know. On that note, what are we what are yeah, we talking what the, what about? What the hell are we talking what, about? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so uh for this episode we are discussing the 1996 short-lived sitcom high society so high society was in fact a show it aired on cbs uh from october 95 to february 96 and had a total of 13 episodes um, it was created by Robert Horn and Daniel Morgosis, who wrote for other popular sitcoms including designing women and Living Single. The show follows the campy adventures and misadventures and antics, whatever you want to call them, of uh, wealthy, eccentric ladies in Manhattan, uh, Ellie, a romance novelist, and Dot, her publisher. Jean Smart, the iconic Jean Smart, plays Ellie, and Mary McDonald plays Dot. Other characters include Brendan, Dot's teenage Republican son, played by Dan o O'Donoghue, Peter, Dot's business partner, played by David Rash, Stefano, Dot's assistant, played by Luigi Amadeo, Alice, Dot's socialite mother, played by Jane Meadows, and Val, Ellie and Dot's college friend, played by Faith Prince. 
high society was often thought and regarded to be an American version of the hit UK comedy, Absolutely Fabulous, although it's not a straight up adaptation like other ones we've seen, like The Office, because the characters and details are slightly different, but it's in the same in the sense that it follows two very kind of eccentric, campy, wealthy women. Um, so I chose to cover this sitcom because I'm a huge fan of Jean Smart. She's like one of my favorite actors. And recently I've become a huge fan of David Rash, um, whom uh, many of you will know as Carl on Succession. And <laughs> I think he's like my one of the more underrated characters. Um, so, yeah, so that's basically why I picked it, because I just really wanted to see both of them in the mid 90s. Um, but yeah, yeah. What, any thoughts right off the bat, well, you two? As soon as I hit play, my first thought was ju- I saw Gene Smart and I was just like, I wish I was watching Hacks instead. Yeah, because <laughs> <laughs> Hacks is a hell of a show. Yeah. But um, actually, after watching a couple episodes of this, it feels like she's playing a similar character. This is like her her character from Hacks, but without the funny, because yeah. um, oh. she's like a. I mean, she is funny. She's like her, funny. Yeah, but but the the show didn't make me laugh much. Yeah, but like, know. but like Gene Smart in both shows plays a character who's like a wealthy, successful entertainer of some sort. In this case, she's like an author of romance novels and hacks. She's a stand-up comedian. But in both cases, she's like an entertainer who made lots of money and kind of lives alone in a mansion and has lots of diamonds and has a big ego. Uh, and, and there's like a similar tone even in her performance. It's just that. Yeah. That show's way funnier. Barry, how about you? Initial thoughts? It's a real Gene Smart type. I mean, <laughs> yeah. you know. Yeah. Um, you know... You know, there's a lot of jokes that kind of hit the floor, um, but both Gene Smart and Mary McDonald are very funny. Yes. Yeah, uh, they're great. And it, it, it actually sort of won me over pretty kind of gradually where I just realized that I do really enjoy the two of them together and I like seeing them bounce off each other. So I was kind of. I was kind of on board mostly. Um, I was really glad to see that they kind of. Uh, you know, between episodes, not between episodes, but like the the thrust of the 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 first, you know, the thrust of the pilot being them reconnecting with their yeah. you know college friend. I was glad to see that that kind of uh, eventually petered out because it was <laughs> by far the worst part of the show, and it was almost kind of mean spirited. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, because they're kind of making fun of her the whole time. Yeah, and like Faith Price Prince Prince, yeah, Prince Faith Prince. Uh. She's playing the character way too real. Yeah. Uh, because yeah. you're just like, oh man, stop showing how much these insults are hurting you. It's really yeah, like, it's, it's really rough. uncomfortable for me. Yeah. So, yeah, the funny thing is that whole subplot about, so like, uh, the, this show was like built on the premise that it was going to be this like chosen family of women. So, you know, it's like the, the two main characters, Dottie, or sorry, Dot. And Ellie and then Val was going to be thrown into the mix as sort of like at first sort of an antagonist for Ellie. But eventually, like the idea is that they become this like little unit, the three of them. But after episode six, um, Val is like written off of the show without any explanation. <laughs> yeah, well, I think I, so, I agree with that. Because again, I get, I get it. Yeah, didn't I get quite it. work. And then the the focus became for the remainder of the series just the kind of like extra behavior yeah. of this dynamic Ellie duo. And Dot. Yeah. yeah. I agree with Barry's point. It's like, it, as soon as you said that, I was like, oh yeah. Cause like, that's what was odd about it was that like, it's almost like they were in two different shows. Yeah, you have the yeah, characters yeah. who are giving like these big, these big splashy performances. performances yeah. And then this old college friend who did not even seem so much like a sitcom character as much as just like a more genuine, like she was a character out of like an indie film dramedy who's like way more down to earth and grounded and normal. Yeah. And but, I think she I mean, came her- off, she came off a different sitcom is what yeah. she came off. Yeah, of. She like came she- off a family sitcom yeah, okay. into like a, 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 a farcical yeah. like, 
Yes. Mean spirited yeah. sitcom, yeah. and the two don't mesh. Yeah, no. it, it's <laughs> one of those things where I did feel like her performance was a little big as well, yeah. but in a very wholesome way. Yeah, that yeah. didn't quite match wholesome. Yeah, the world, and I guess the idea is like it maybe it being a fish out of water, but there was something about this specific way it's presented that it just kind of was a little flat for yeah. me. Like yeah. it just didn't quite work. It didn't quite work in the same way. Probably because, you know, normally when it's like a fish out of water, that fish out of water is the protagonist, whereas Val wasn't necessarily the protagonist. We weren't following her. We <laughs> were point. definitely following Ellie and Dot more. Okay, so, so I'm so glad you yeah. said that, because that is literally one of my notes. I, I, oh, I'm so glad funny. you said fish out of water, Yeah, because I, I, I started making a bunch of notes after watching the second episode we watched yeah. about trying to think about shows about affluent people of yeah. these sorts of, you know, high society types, shows that do work. Yeah. And yeah. realizing that the reason they work is that there's a, a good character involved who is a fish out of water yeah. who does not come from that type. Yeah. And that character is super critical. And I was like, okay, so like the nanny is yeah. a fish out of water story where the protagonist is a nanny for a rich guy. Yeah. And then the Fresh Prince of Bel Air, same yeah. thing. Fish out of water, main character. He comes from like a yeah. poor family and he goes to move in with yeah. his auntie and uncle in Bel Air who are rich. And that's the whole, the juxtaposition is critical. Yeah, but that's, yeah, like the, the character of Will and the character of Nanny Fine, like those are big characters. Yeah. They're the fish out of water. They're the kind of like people that don't belong. But they are like, yeah, they're big, big, bold characters. So right. it matches. Whereas it's like this other character is like this wholesome kind of lady from the suburbs, like a very normal, low key person who's plopped into this high society world. You know, it's so interesting. Um, this kind of reminds me of the dynamic from the other two. Yeah. Mary, have you watched <laughs> this at all? You gotta no. watch uh, for, everybody, for everybody for everybody out there uh, who has caught on. I don't watch a lot of modern. Oh my stuff. god, Dude, Barry! Funniest show on TV right now. It is. You guys say that about every show no, on TV. No, 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 no. no, no. no. It's so, the other two. The reason I bring up the other two is because Molly Shannon's character is very much one of these like average. Like it's yeah. like what they they're trying to do that with this character where she's like this like lady from the suburbs who would have like the live, laugh, love, like <laughs> like barn yeah. door art on her wall and stuff. And like like a very like normal, nice, wholesome lady. Yeah. Okay. But then she gets plunked into this world of fame because of her children. And then she becomes famous herself. And it's like a whole thing, right? And it goes over the top. But her character's energy as this like kind of wholesome, like, Midwestern kind of lady is big, and yeah. and they should. Well, she's Molly Shannon, yeah. so I would imagine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So it's kind of like, yeah, they should have done amped it up a little bit more yeah. with this. Yeah, you need uh, a Molly Shannon to make that character that, work. But, but that's not to say that you know there was anything wrong with the no. performance. No, 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 nothing um, wrong with it. It just I think it was more the writing. Like they didn't know how to write a woman like that. That's the thing. Yeah. I think I think they were very comfortable. With writing for these wealthy divas. Divas, yeah. You know, but they weren't as comfortable writing for this, like, grounded, wholesome yeah. lady. Yeah. So, I don't know. It's so interesting. Like, I think that it was very smart for them to, like, pivot away from that and focus on those two women because, you know, they obviously had a passion for these kinds of over-the-top characters like yeah. all the references were very much of that world, you know, like they reference like they make jokes about Ivana Trump uh, about like, you know, there's a huge runner about Elizabeth Taylor in the second episode, which we'll get to. And there is like like just all of these like references were on point for that like world yeah. of like, yeah. you know. I think personally is, yeah, there's a reason why she leaves. And honestly, the whole first episode and. Very much baked into the script. Yeah. I kept feeling like this character was getting in the way of a sitcom that I might have wanted to watch. Right. And the yeah, show yeah. kind of knows that. 
because the show is like, oh, you know, she's really putting a damper on their relationship like that. And I'm just like, yeah. And the show. And like anytime she showed up, like if I was casting this <laughs> in another way, I'm throwing Rachel Dratch in there. I'm throwing uh, like yeah. a character who is hilariously sucking the fun out of something. Right. Yeah, like very um, silly. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so down to earth that yeah. she's to the point of being silly, which yeah. actually it's dawning on me. So, okay. Because I also noted like there is an example I could think of of a show where there are a couple of characters who are kind of quasi high society or higher society who th think of themselves as fancy. Yeah. And then there's another character who's the fish out of water. And I know I always fall back on this show for these analyses, but Frasier. Okay. Yeah. And Frasier's Frasier and Niles and yeah. their dad. But where it's different, where I think that show succeeds in that because the dad is not the protagonist, but he's the fish out of water is that Frasier was the fish out of water in Cheers. Yeah. And every fucking person watching that show knows that. Mm -hmm. And that the mm -hmm. whole point of Frasier is, what if you took the dynamic from Cheers and flipped it? And yeah. the dad is different from his sons to the point of that difference being comedic. And everybody, and honestly, everybody around. Everyone yeah, around Frasier and Niles is... Yeah. Different, different from like them. Yeah. Everyone, you Roz know, from, is from Roz Daphne's to Daphne, different. yeah, to Bulldog, like all yeah. of them don't <laughs> yeah. fit in with with Fraser and Niles. Yeah. So to they're the, point the protagonists, where, yeah. and they're of high society, but they're surrounded by people who are different from them. Yeah. yeah. So even though they're the protagonists, and they're not quite the ones who are supposed to be the fish out of water, they still sort of are. You're right. And then also, like in Fraser, we get the promise of the premise, which we don't get in this show, yeah. which is that Fraser is a radio talk show therapist. And yeah. every episode, you're in the radio studio and callers call in and he tries to give them therapy. And in this show, I think the thing that like kind of annoyed me the most is like, they're supposed to be like these divas about town in Manhattan, high society, yeah. right? We don't get enough of that. Wait, especially. Yeah. Well, we only watched Maybe, two episodes. I bet, you we, I bet you we did. I know I we only watched we two episodes. Yeah. But if you're talking about like why that pilot didn't work, it's like because yeah. the pilot. Well, yeah. The what, that plot line of having like the, the woman they know from college suddenly come into the fray. That's like a season two thing. But yeah, like, it, feels right. like a re it feels like a retool. A re it does feel like yeah. a retool. That's very astute. Like they're doing at, that off the yeah. top. But the pilot for a show with this premise yeah. should have had the. Like, the only way I know how to say it is, like, this show walked so that Sex in the City could fly. Like, yeah. Sex in the City, I don't know. It's Arrested like Development is what was yeah. bringing him to mind a lot because, yes. like, like, Mrs. I, Blue, like, Lucille like, Bluth. Lu Lucille yeah. Bluth, yeah. I think this show, like, was best as right a. Lucille as Bluth. A, there <laughs> in my notes, right there. It was best as a farce about high society, and it's yeah. better when everyone's a cartoon, yeah. right? Yeah. Like, Jokes like there's, you know, there's some pretty dark jokes in this that only work if we're accepting them as cartoons who yes. are terrible. Yeah. Not you, which means yes, you can't exactly. juxtapose a real person yes. to them. Yes. Good point. Very yes. good point. So, okay. So I'll just briefly, like, Aaron basically covered <laughs> the plot of the pilot because nothing really happens. Like, basically, we just. No, no, meet, that's it. Yeah. We meet the characters. Yeah. And get a bunch of exposition dumps. And like Val comes in and shakes everything up. So basically, immediately we we meet uh, Dot and her son Brendan, and it's immediately established that he's like this like young preppy kid at private school who's a Republican and all this, and that uh, uh, like Dot has is a divorcee and she's inherited basically a majority control of her husband's Once publishing. Again. Once again, Company. as a plot point. Yeah. 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 So uh, and that David Rash's character, Peter, is her kind of like a uh, reluctant business partner. But he's kind of this like gross, like like I love how basically David Rash pl always plays like not the number one guy. Like he always plays like a top executive. Yeah. But he's always like number two or number three in the pecking order, you know? This is a proto Carl here. He's yes. like, this is Carl. Yeah. This was definitely yeah. Carl in the 90s. Yeah. Exactly. But he yeah. he's a little more animated in this. Like, he's a little more over the top yeah, and a little more, yeah, yeah sitcom y. 
But yeah, there's but dark- not drastically different. So yeah, so we meet all of them, and we meet um we meet um Dot's assistant Stefano, um who also kind of like hangs out with with Ellie, and you know he always offers like a sassy retort and a different you know thing. Like he's always like part of the mix, uh, and then. Yeah, so we just kind of get all these like little exposition dumps. Like we meet, um, we also meet Dot's mother, Alice, who's like this socialite and is like also very eccentric, also a cartoon. Basically, she's kind of like a Lucille Bluth for sure. Yeah. Like she's definitely a Lucille Bluth because she's, you know, oh, just like a kept kind of wife. Um, And yeah, so basically Val comes into the mix and... For whatever reason, I guess because she's now divorcing her husband, she has to come live with Dot for some reason. So she decides to come live with Dot and it causes all these issues because Ellie had a bit of a rivalry with with Val because Val married um, one of Ellie's former boyfriends. And so it's causing all this tension with their working relationship and all of this stuff. So, yeah, so it's like all this like push and pull, like, can they make this whole dynamic work? And obviously the answer is no, because she gets written out of the show. (laughs) (laughs) And then they all get written out of the show soon after. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so the whole thing is literally just setting up this dynamic. So there's not much of a plot. It's just literally, can they make this work? Can they? And then it's revealed near the end that Val is like actually pregnant. So the idea is going to be that all these like women are, are going to become this like little, like I said, found family, which is kind of a sweet thing that, you know, I enjoy. But yeah, like it just like not much happens. A lot more happens in the other episode, which we'll we'll get to. Yeah. Where I was going with it, that this is this seemed like an el- element of proto sex in the city, but without succeeding at it, is that when you have like these diva socialites of high society, Like, I want to see them at parties. I want to see them sipping champagne in a room with 100 people. I want to see them Mm -hmm. working a room. At lots of, like, charity galas. At lots of charity galas. I want to see them go. There probably was more of that. Maybe, maybe. I imagine there's lots of that. Sure, but what I'm saying is put that in the pilot. Yeah. In the pilot, I need to see them having brunch. I need to see them out in Manhattan doing their thing. That's the premise of the characters. Kick it off with that. Maybe they didn't give them very much money. And so they had to, for this pilot, probably not. But they had enough money for that staircase. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, but that's a set they use all the time. (laughs) That set was probably used in half the sitcoms at that time. Yeah. Okay. This is a little detour. Okay. But I I have to go here because all the elements have fallen into place through no fault of my own. (laughs) Uh Uh-huh. We've talked about <laughs> Carl and the connection between him and this show in succession. We've talked about Arrested Development. Earlier today, right before this recording session, I just finished watching Succession. I just finished the finale. I'm not going to say anything about what happens in case anyone listening hasn't seen it. And I'm I not feel gonna, like everybody's not, seen it at this point. They probably have, but, but I'm not going to do <laughs> No, any... no, I think it's very fair. I yeah. don't think anybody yeah. needs no, sudden succession No spoilers, spoilers. and I'm yeah. not going to talk about Succession. What I am going to talk about is I heard, I'm going to talk about a sitcom. I heard, I saw some sort of joke online comparing succession to Arrested Development. And as I was watching, I got to thinking about it and I was like, actually, it lines up so perfectly, (laughs) so perfectly. Where have you you been, man? (laughs) Okay, but. (laughs) I mean, I haven't heard of this. What? That was the whole discussion over the show when it launched. No, so I'm going (laughs) to, then then I'm going to, then Barry, you don't have to listen. I'm going to say for Bryn's benefit. Okay, okay. Here here you have, (laughs) as the main theme, you have this asshole patriarch who founded a successful company. And now he's soon going to be like departing. In the case of Arrested Development, he's going to prison. In the case of Succession, he might retire or he might die, whatever the case may be. But that's you actually have, how that's actually how Arrested Development starts too. Sure, yeah. he's, and then he's what, retiring and about to party. get the company yeah. to yeah. Yeah. retirement party. And you have four kids, three boys and a girl, <laughs> all grown now. So three yeah. men and a woman, three men and one woman, who are all kind of jockeying for their positions in life, coming out of the shadow of this dominating 
patriarch yeah, yeah. who's a terrible father yeah. and gave them no love. And you have the one son who thinks that he's probably the obvious successor because he. So you're, fit- so you're saying that. So Michael, Michael Bluth is, is Kendall. Kendall. Okay. Okay. He's <laughs> he's a father and not a great one. And he thinks he's the. Well, Michael's a better Michael, father. I'll get to that. I'll get to that. But he he Michael. Weirdly enough. <laughs> weirdly enough. But the point is, like, he is a father yeah. and he thinks he's the natural successor yeah. to the company. And he just is so baffled that his si- his siblings don't all just automatically agree with that. Then you have the, like, emotionally stunted, super childish son who's the only one who kind of still likes the mom. And so that's where you have Buster slash uh, Roman. Okay. You know, the one who- I don't know. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The- Losing me on that one. I feel like I feel like uh Connor is is Buster. No, no, no. Connor yeah. is Job because he's the one okay. who at the start of the series is not really part of the mix. He's right. off doing his own thing with his own ambitions, and the only reason he gets back involved is purely FOMO. Like yeah. he never gave a shit and now suddenly he's back when it looks like there might be an opportunity to jockey for power. The only reason he wants to get involved is because he doesn't want his brother to have that more, feels more like than Roman. Him. That feels like yeah, Roman. That feels like that Roman. Too. So it's not a straight. But it's not. It's not, yeah. st- it's not perfect. It's not perfect. But I'm just saying I, this is my opinion. What I think well, is, the, is the breakdown. Well, apparently, Aaron, maybe you should wrap this up because apparently you're a little bit 2000 and late with this. Sure, but obvious know? and obviously, you know, Shiv is yeah. Lindsay and yeah. uh, Lindsay has a child. Shiv is going to have a child. Neither Oops, of them are qualified to be parents. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's a bit of a spoiler there. <laughs> well, okay, I'm. It's that's a relatively small detail okay, in the grand okay. scheme of things. I in do, that show. I do, I do enjoy uh, picturing Tobias in the uh, Tom Wombs scams role. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, because yeah. Tobias, <sighs> his he doesn't so much. I feel l- like Tobias is like a cousin Greg or something. <laughs> in some ways, yes, but it's like Tobias. Yeah, but Tob- he thinks he's he thinks he's Tom, right? Yeah, but he's yeah, really yeah. cousin Greg. <laughs> Tom, yeah. Yes, Tobias yeah. thinks he's a Tom, but he's a Greg. But yeah. either way, he doesn't so much love any of them in this family as much as he just wants to be adjacent to the wh- right. the whiff of power. I mean, you know what? Like this is a pattern that's come <laughs> that's come up time and time again with us recording twas. The less the, le- the less engaged we were with the actual show, the more likely that Aaron will go off on a tangent or any of us will go off on a tangent about other shows that we're more invested in. So <laughs> let's get back on track. Like, let's... Blow, uh, blow your mind again. Succession and Royal Tenenbaums, yeah. which is also a rest of development. I mean, it's a, tro- it's a trope, right? Uh, yeah. They're all tropes. And I mean, this show is also full of tropes. Like, it's also full of... You know, my one last nugget is in succession. They're always flying around in private jets and in Arrested Development, they've lost most of their money. So they no longer have the jet, but they still have the stair car, <laughs> <laughs> which is the pathetic comedic version of get a some private hop- jet. You're going to get some hop ons. Yeah. You're going to get some hop ons. <laughs> They're always flying around on the stair car. <laughs> OK. I mean, okay, so I would love, okay, let's move on. Let's talk about episode 13, because it's like a very fun episode. So it is the last episode that aired on TV. And I made a very fun discovery about this particular episode, which I'll kind of like make sure I tease a bit at the end. Um, But yeah, basically it, it starts, it kicks off like, you know, with Dot stopping by Ellie's place to see that she's tied up and there's like a robbery in progress. Classic 90s tied up robbery. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and but the the kind of twist is that this burglar is like a very like kind of highfalutin guy himself. High, high society burglar. Yeah, yeah. So he's like very um has this snooty like you know I guess a British accent and is very like polite in the way. And, and he is very refined with what he chooses to steal. And like, it's like a very, you know, funny exchange. And there's immediately jokes about how, you know, there's miscommunication and like a misunderstanding about the being tied up part being like some kinky, like post date romp that Ellie's having. And she's like, no, it's actually like a violent robbery. And like, 
she you know she's explaining to dot how she gets into this mess and it's she thinks that he's tying her up to have a kinky romp but then it turns into a robbery so it's like those kind of predictable jokes um at like at one point ellie's mom alice bursts into the apartment with a gun and says like she's been dying to use the gun indoors and like it's like a whole thing um like the robber he does he gets away right correct yeah he gets away yeah yeah, yeah. Know, they and, don't we don't revisit we don't yeah, revisit yeah, yeah. but the thing that Ellie's most upset about, of course, is that her Valium has been stolen. You know, it's like more like just like building to that whole like idea of like she's a very specific woman. Like she likes her pills. She likes, you know, you know, she likes to to date and see lots of men. And, you know, it's like the predictable kind of jokes. Um, but then there's also the trope that we just saw in the single guy where post robbery, there's like this like revelation about huh. life and reevaluating life where suddenly Ellie decides she wants to be a mother which is so random. <laughs> yeah. 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 So basically, yeah, it's like uh, there there's all kinds of things where they they start going on this like campaign to like look for potential father like fathers and it's unclear whether it's like a donor or she's going to actually have sex with these guys and get pregnant. Um, I think we know. I'm pretty <laughs> sure we know what's going on. Yeah. So, yeah. So there's like so there's like this whole montage that I feel like was a little clunky with the way it was like written. But, you know, it's just like this montage of like Ellie saying yes and and Dot oh, saying no. That and montage like, was terrible. Yeah, it was like not great. It was not great. I, but I whatever. thought I had some fun. I thought some fun. Uh, I had I had some fun yeah. with it. At, at one point, the downstairs. The men need the men needed to be funnier. Yes, the men needed to. Well, be, yeah. Well, they had to have more to <laughs> the say. The girls were the the women were amazing. Yes, and like every yes no got a laugh from me. But okay. Yeah. But yeah, because well, they're amazing performers. Yeah, yeah that's clear. But everything else is clunky. Yeah. Everything it's a, else it's is just, phoned it's in. It's just a little bit like it could have used more of a like punch up or something, in my opinion. A um, lot of this could. A lot of this could have used a punch up. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So there's like, you know, at one point they get to borrow the downstairs neighbor's baby, <laughs> which is wild. Which is not like, a thing, by the leave? way. Well, they were like, babysitting. Leave. They offered to babysit. Yeah, they, they just because they're so clueless. That's how they described it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so there are some jokes that are so specific that I chuckled at, but I'm like, oh, this is for such a specific audience. Like, you know, like the diapers from the Ivana baby. You know, that's good. Yeah, Ivana you know, baby. <laughs> and then the little tiny baby hangers. From the Faye Dunaway collection, because you I know like the that. whole yeah. Faye Dunaway as Mommy Dearest, no wire yeah. hangers. Uh, yeah, and yeah, and then there's like this whole following, like watching the baby. She kind of gets used to the baby, and then she like passes out while holding the baby, which is kind of scary. <laughs> <laughs> but conveniently, they don't really show that. It just go launches into a dream sequence um, where she like dreams of what her child would be like when they're older. And it's a nightmare because this dot, this like, you know, fantasy daughter is exactly like her and is a nightmare. And she's like old and doesn't want get to go out anymore and do things. So that's like basically it. She's like, oh, no, I'm not going to be a mother. <laughs> and. The thing that I really liked about that, though, was in the moments where Ellie is is saying to Dot, you know, oh, I guess I'm not meant to be a mother after all. And I guess I'm just going to be alone. Dot responds in such a like great way. She says, you know, you're never going to be alone. You've got me. And like they have this thing where they are singing that I got you, babe, like the Sonny and Cher. I got you, babe, together. And I thought it was actually very sweet because it, it was. was it it's, was very sweet. It was very nice to see. I, I, will, I will say that was sweet. Yeah. They both I, said they loved each other. They said they're going to grow old together. Yeah. I thought that was very sweet. I thought yeah. that was a very nice, sweet scene. I agree that I liked it and that they sang together and that rapport there. What I wish is that the show had like reverse engineered everything else backwards from that. 
Yeah. Like there because it felt to me like it came a little out of nowhere, the tone of that scene. I don't know. I thought they played it well because they were still campy. Yeah. But yeah, like, I like I like obviously I, I, I it, it really it really won a lot of points for me. Having not seen a lot of the ep- episodes in between episode one and 13, you know, I have to assume that hopefully they earned that moment. But like, yeah, yeah I don't know. I just thought like that was uh, a well, nice their relationship. Their codependent relationship makes sense. Yeah. yeah I mean- and they joke about being codependent with each other and stuff and like. I thought that given the fact that this was like the last episode ever aired, I thought that was a really good way to end it. You know, Mm -hmm. like I thought it was like a strong, (laughs) you know, because like it kind of leaves it open for if they did get another season. But it also is like a good note to end on, period. If only it did end there. (laughs) If only that was how (laughs) the episode ends. Okay, so let's get into it. So the other element of this episode that really stands out is the fact that, uh, okay, so Ellie, when she's getting robbed, she gets uh, a lot of jewelry stolen, because obviously, right? And then the cops show up near the end, and uh, it's also kind of mentioned early on that Elizabeth Taylor had also been robbed (laughs) <laughs> who is like in the area or whatever. I can't quite remember how she fits into that specific social group, whether she has like a home in that building or what. It's believable because it's a very ritzy building. Yeah, their penthouse is yeah, super yeah, yeah. fancy. They, yeah, they just sort of say that like, oh, you know, the same thing happened to Elizabeth Taylor. And what's at uh, watching this n- damn near 30 years later, my brain is like, is this something that happened to Elizabeth Taylor that I didn't know about? Well, uh, I had the okay. same thought. Yeah, I was yeah. like, is this out but, of the newspapers? Guys, wait for it. But, okay, there's a there's a lot going on here. This is like a very layered thing. So just buckle up. So, okay. So basically, the cops show up and they bring back jewelry that they assume is Ellie's jewelry. And they look at it and they immediately recognize it as being like Elizabeth Taylor's jewelry because probably because she's been photographed in this jewelry and they're like, oh, should we tell him that it's not ours? Or (laughs) like, should we? (laughs) Yeah, thank you for our jewelry. And then Elizabeth Taylor herself shows up. However, she's not, it doesn't appear on camera. Okay. It's, it's again, weirdly, it's similar to- Very weird. Yeah. Because it's it's her. (laughs) Yes, yes. The whole thing is very weird, but we'll get it. there's, There's a lot more to this so yeah so <laughs> kind of similar again to single guy i'm finding all these like weird like similarities to single guy they had the whole paul mccartney beat where he's off camera and like talking to them but this actually is elizabeth taylor which is wild so she has like she's like oh like you know that's my jewelry so she basically like takes back her black pearls and she says her iconic line from her ad campaign at the time that these have always brought me luck (laughs) Mm. in her weird accent that's like not really British but is British I don't know anyway so it's like that was like her line because like in the mid 90s she was you know she was in her like MILF era this like like older (laughs) regal lady diva who was all you know she had her white diamonds perfume which was like very popular and it yeah. was a reference to that. Yes, it was. It was a reference to that. And then when she leaves, they're like, oh, and something smells really good. Yeah. So they're like, you know, OK, so you think it's over there. But then it cuts to the tag is we're suddenly in Maxwell Sheffield from the nanny's house. <laughs> OK, and so they're now talking. He and Fran Fine are talking about how, oh, thank God, Elizabeth. Taylor got her jewelry back. They found her black pearls. And uh, so, you know, so it's like this like weird crossover, but not really a crossover because they don't appear in any of the same scenes with the ladies from high society. So, yeah, so it's this thing. And the Fran Fine is like it makes some comment about how oh, but do we know it's definitely the black pearls because they could have been switched for fake ones. And and so there's this weird, weird, complicated line. And then it hard cuts to Rosie O'Donnell in a cab 
driving off with a string of black pearls saying like, you know, I quit. Like, thanks. You know, I'm going to retire now. Thanks, Liz, wherever you are. So obviously the very short lived Rosie. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So it's like a very weird thing. And so this obviously piqued my curiosity. So it turns out that on that night in 1996, it was Liz Night on CBS. So there were four sitcoms that aired in that like kind of block of programming that all had intersecting storylines related to Elizabeth Taylor and this like jewel heist. And like at the end of the nanny or like the end of uh this. The, this this seems like it was the end. Yeah, it was like they were thanking she, you know Elizabeth Taylor herself actually appears in on screen with um, Fran Drescher, and she's thanking all the CBS stars for helping her recover her uh, her black pearls. So I was like, oh my god, this is like amazing. So it's basically um, so it's high society, the nanny, obviously uh, Murphy Brown, and can't hurry love all had a storyline related to this. Is that what Rosie O'Donnell's show was called? No. I thought that was just Rosie. No, no, no. So it was Rosie O'Donnell playing this cab driver. Yeah, but that was from her show. She didn't She didn't have a sitcom, though. Didn't she? No. She had her very successful talk show at the time. So, yeah. So Rosie O'Donnell was just a guest star in that episode. Wow, it's so weird. I could have sworn she had a sitcom before. Okay, I'm, her... I'm going to look this up right yeah. now to see. But basically, I would love to do a separate, very special episode about Liz Knight because I think it's such a wild thing that they, like, like what a stunt to pull. <laughs> like, get a legendary actor to participate in this, like, funny, like... It's... It's funny, but it just reminds me of like it's the shit that like TGIF used to do all yes, the time. Like exactly. But like because it's CBS, like they're just so bad at it. Because I don't they're know. CBS. I think it's fun, but because it's like it's for an adult audience, you know? Like it's it's Yeah. But see, this is the the real the really fun thing about TV in the 90s is you could do stuff like this. Oh sure, you they were everything was the MCU back then. Yeah, they, yeah, you can't do stuff like this now. Like I guess, like you said, in the MCU, they kind of like they have these crossover things, but it's not this like very specific event that happens where basically the network forces you to watch for like a full block of programming on a given night, so that you. Like they have everybody's attention on their block of programming. They get a certain amount of eyeballs to see this this thing through, you know, whereas like on streaming, everyone's watching things whenever the hell they feel like it. So it's like not you can't really pull this off in the same way. So, not at all. No, not at all. So it was kind of a it was a, it's like one of the more fun elements of actual traditional broadcast television. Aaron, you're now in a, going down a rabbit <laughs> hole on your phone there. Well, uh, as far as I can tell, Rosie O'Donnell did not have her own no. sitcom no, at the this time. No, is, this is wild. But, because like I'm in a real like Mandela effect thing where I yeah. remembered her playing a cab driver. Yeah. And now, she yeah. probably did in movies, She may Barry. have played a cab driver role in something else. <sighs> but I just want to also say it doesn't look like she's credited for that role at all yeah she, she's playing a char- she's playing a character called cosette which she was playing on the on the nanny that night yeah so clearly oh, they see. just she clearly just didn't weirdly enough they just didn't credit her for okay or, no no sorry way more accurately she was absolutely credited because she was in the credits okay but nobody has added that yeah credit okay, to so imdb right. yeah, because yeah. IMDb is crowdsourced so and she, nobody gave yeah, a shit. Yeah, exactly. So she's, cr- so yeah, so that character was from the nanny's story world and that was part of the, the crossover. Maybe I saw that yeah. episode as a kid yeah, and remembered maybe you did. her. And it's just implanted in your brain. Like, you know, it's, and yeah. Here's even, here's what's even weirder is the very next season of the nanny, there's a plot where Fran goes on the Rosie the, O'Donnell the, the show. The Rosie O'Donnell yeah. show. Yeah. So, that's the kind of thing that Bryn hates. She hates when actors 
appear in the same role or on the same show as two different characters. <laughs> yeah, I, I can't handle it. It makes it bra- me really it angry. Her. I yeah. don't it like her. crossovers, period. Uh, oh. No, I like I crossovers. I like a good crossover. I just don't like when an actor, yeah. like, yeah. yeah. It it because it just ruins everything, and I don't. I, yeah, I, I don't, know. I don't but like. I it. just the the whole crossover thing. It just I don't know. I guess I, I love it. I didn't. I, I love it. It's it's silly. It's campy, but it's fun. It's like it's too campy for know? me. It's too breaking the fourth wall. Campy for me. Well, I don't know. I mean, I I I don't. Feel... Mo- I don't. I'll say though, I don't mind as much the whole Phoebe Ursula buffet thing because it wasn't a one off. Yeah, because and it wasn't it wasn't intended. It was that right. just yeah. sort of happened right. to work it, out. It that evolved way. organically, and it wasn't a one time deal. But yeah. when it's a novelty thing of just like the way that it's done here, when it's just like a one time yeah. novelty gag, yeah, eh, I don't know. But the Liz Knight thing is so iconic. That's so like, weird. I I'm so obsessed with this now, and I want to watch the entire block of programs. And like, I'm gonna I'm gonna let you guys handle that one. <laughs> Unless unless I'm gonna get the Liz's from publicity, I'm not ah. I'm not in. I mean, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I got bangs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. I I I'm really ashamed to admit this to you guys, but there's like, you know, there there's a lot all over the internet right now about this like scandal from that show Vanderpump Rules. So I went on a bit of a like deep dive into like Vanderpump rules and like I'm I'm deeply ashamed. Like Aaron's I'm judging surprised. me. I, I I'm surprised you didn't watch that. That f- that felt like up your alley. I just, oh yeah. Can, but but here here's where I'm no, going can, with can, that. Can I, just, I feel like the Liz characters are based on one of the girls in that show cuz <laughs> in one of the scenes, <laughs> I won't name the person, but she's she says lotion, she's like lotion. <laughs> 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 And like, I I feel it's like, a real type, man. I've yeah, met so many. I feel like I've met so many Liz's in my day. Can you explain yeah. though, like from that show? What does Vanderpump like, mean? Lisa it's Vanderpump. Their name. That's a name. Their, Lisa their Vanderpump name. is a. <laughs> so she was. She started as one of the housewives. So she's like a house that uh, from one of the seasons. I can't remember if it was Housewives of Beverly Hills. I think it's Housewives of Beverly Hills. And <laughs> but she's like a a an an icon like she has opened Debatable. restaurants all over the world <laughs> like she is like a, a restaurateur and basically Vanderpump Rules is a spinoff of like Real Housewives but it's about <laughs> Lisa Vanderpump open like running her restaurants and at one of these particular restaurants there's like a lot of like like attractive young people that are very messy and dramatic and so it's basically like their attempt at making the Housewives franchise younger because it's all people in their 20s and 30s. And it's been a long running show. And this year there is like this like, you know, scandal with one of the main characters called Tom Sandoval. And so it's called Scandoval. <laughs> uh. And... Uh, <laughs> And it's the lowest common denominator of things to be interested in, but I'm now hooked into the whole, this whole is, drama. This of is it my all. payback for my Arrested Development rant. But, is this tangent? What but, did I do? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but but it, it's like you know, it, it's so fascinating because if you, you like, it's the show started in 2013, and you watch some of these episodes from 2013, and it seems like a hundred years ago with the how like the the kind of the way they talk about things, the way people are are dressing, I'm like, this is so. What has happened in ten years in terms of things you should not be saying anymore, and <laughs> things like, you know, it's just wild. I'm like, was this 2013 or was this 1993? Like, I don't understand. And yeah, it's it's a it's kind of fascinating, and I feel like a lot of the people from this cast are going to get a lot of backlash because a lot of people are fascinated by this current scandal and they're going back and re-watching all these old episodes and it's I don't know anyway anyway back, <laughs> back to high society but it's it's not for just- the record I thought I knew what Vanderpump rules was 
And that was not what I thought it was. So Oh, oh, okay. Bravo. What did you think Bra- it was? Oh, I knew okay. Literally I knew on she, Bravo. <laughs> I knew who she was. Yeah. Okay. Uh and then I, I guess I, I didn't know the restaurant part. I didn't know she owned any restaurants. I just thought it was just like uh like the Kmart version of keeping up with their Kardashians, where it was just like a slightly even less famous person is now famous and we're following that. No, so Lisa, I, so Lisa Vanderpump is this very glamorous like lady who she's older. Like she's she she's kind of this like cougar type, but she's like very happily married and she's like she's a very stunning, elegant, charismatic woman. And then it's so it's her, and at the start of the series, she's in her I I believe like she's like forties, fifties. Oh, and thank then, God. And then, but then her, it's all of her employees that are the main focus. They're and the, they're the rules. They're the ones following the rules. Yeah. The, but the Vanderpump rules. But it's ba- to summarize, it's basically like a bunch of people who are very amoral and drinking too much and fucking each other. And it's like, it's people Jer- cheating it's on Jer- each other. It's Real Housewives. It's Jersey it, Shore. Exactly, it's the Hills. It's exactly. the same show. It's, it's all of that <laughs> stuff. It's all of that stuff. But it's like, yeah, I don't know. It's <laughs> so, yeah, Barry. So, in case you're wondering, hey, man, I don't. I'm not yucking nobody's yo. But I, you know I what? say, I've, if you enjoy, if anybody enjoys anything and it ain't hurting anybody, I say, at, have at it. At this stage of my life, for some reason, I've gone into this weird fascination with reality TV. I've always icked reality TV, but. I've gotten into it recently because I find that it's so low stakes for me and it's so easy to have on in the background where because I don't I'm not trying to follow a plot line. I'm just Mm -hmm. hearing people. You know what I mean? So it's like the perfect company in the background when I just need noise. I mean, I think I've watched some over the years. I think that's why it ultimately is very successful and won't go away. Um, And I think that there's a real benefit to that kind of entertainment because and I again, I'm I'm also aging uh, and I have a hard time, you know, keeping up with the modern TV in that, like, I'll miss an episode and then I'm three weeks behind and then. I get, you know, a night to watch TV and I'm like, I really don't want to just yeah. watch four hours of heavy shit. Like I yeah. want to. So I do. So instead of that, I'll end up, you know, putting on background shows like, yeah. you know, a lot of people do it with The Office or Friends. For me, it's typically Bob's Burgers or it or it's even Shit's Creek has become yeah. one that I can throw on in the back. But I think there is a, a very real need for that kind of background mindless entertainment that because you can't always be engaged yeah exactly at all time. you can't yeah yeah so it's like definitely reality tv has become the, that for me the, you can or, clean while well you can clean while exactly, it's on exactly like you don't have to pay attention every moment like netflix's dating shows have become that for me like i just finished uh the ultimatum queer love and that was like a fun watch and like so like I, I watched all the Love is Blind shows <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, I don't know what it is, but I'm like, I, I mean, the one thing I'll say is you can't pay me to watch the any of the Kardashian shows, but it was Kirby Jenner. Do you know? No. I don't know who that is. No, no I just I- saw an advertisement for a- Something with Kirby Jenner. And I was like, Ooh, yeah, you, yeah, know, was that? Okay, you know, what would be so funny. If they did a spin-off reality show that was not sanctioned, but it's like some random relative of theirs and it's like so unglamorous. And I would lo- I would or love like that. a parody like spin-off. Well, but pa- then they would sue pa- though. Yeah. That's the thing. They like would there's sue. always but like like oh god, I can't remember her name right now. But there's like like that one member of the Trump family that just fucking hates Donald Trump and like no matter what is always giving interviews about how terrible their family is. <laughs> yeah. Like Well, I was gonna say you, you you said you don't judge people for any reality TV show they watch, and I would say I mostly agree. Uh but you said as long as it doesn't cause harm, and I think that, you know. The, I think a large, the, yeah. I think yeah. The Apprentice caused tangible harm. <laughs> yeah, uh, sadly. But yeah, at the like time, let's, we well, didn't know, right? Let's not go too deep. Let's not go 
go to. Yeah. You know what? The Apprentice, he was, it gave him a catchphrase. He was, no, he, would have re- I, he would have already been, mm, we all knew who he was. Yeah, but there's, there is, you know, I've, I've seen the argument made that, uh, you know, that, that it, it level of, him that too level much of or... fame and boost uh, helped plant uh, a seed in a lot of people's minds that but he I don't actually think anyone at the time would have known where it would end up. No, but no, no but just the idea that it, it helped build that brand into successful businessman from person who prior to The Apprentice was basically bankrupt and was like on the verge of losing everything. And The Apprentice is actually what like saved Donald Trump from uh, from like disappearing into oblivion potentially. Aaron, you're going to offend all of our young Republican listeners. Yeah. Like, oh, <laughs> yeah, to, to bring us back to <laughs> yeah, high society, to high society. Uh, I do I do have a note oh, about boy. the uh, the Repub- the young Republican son. Yeah. Uh, what, a so, what a dud of a character what a dud that of a was. Character. Yeah, kind of pointless, um, right? I mean, like, I get the point of that type of character yeah but like it didn't feel like there was much written into it so one of the things of course is like gene smart's character is always hitting on him and he's oh that's yeah that's and he's rough. 17 <laughs> yeah but yeah. her yeah but her hello every time she sees him is very funny yeah. well it, she pla- <laughs> she plays it in a cartoonish way but yeah. it is a pretty fucked up joke and yeah. to the I point mean, where you can't make she, jokes like that no, now no, no, well, she's a full all. She's a full Glenn Quagmire, basically, but yeah, not yeah. a cartoon. Yeah, that's true. Where she, she is a Quagmire. Where she's yeah. just, how, how, how old are you? 17? When do you turn 18? No. Like, that's one Gross. of the jokes yeah. in the pilot. Yeah. All right. So there's that. But also, um, there was the whole, what I kind of thought was funny was the dangerous gang thing where, where <laughs> um, they made some, co- I forget the whole wording of the joke, but it's some Someone it's a dangerous would, gang you've fallen into. Yeah, he's fallen into some sort of dangerous gang, and he's like the young Republicans. Yeah, and I'm like, yeah, I mean, it has more harm. Yeah, it was they like are a dangerous harmless, gang. It was a more yeah. harmless joke back then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Now um, I'm like, that's a very strong commentary yeah. today. At the time, they probably there's, just thought that was fluff. There's a lot of kind of gross, uh, like underage jokes. Like you know, they even make one toward Peter. When, um, uh, after the robbery, Dot and Ellie are telling Peter about the robbery and, you know, he, they're like, this is not some minor legal issue like your issue with the Girl Scouts. Oh, what, yeah, what was that <laughs> joke about? I, like, I feel like the implication was gross. I guess. That, but that's the, that's the joke I specifically was sort of highlighting in that, that joke only, you can only make that joke if we're aware of these characters being cartoons and yeah, being horrible ha- yeah. hateable and that's the kind of joke you wouldn't be able to tell yeah. when you're trying to juxtapose them as people yeah. because yeah. yeah yeah because those are family guy jokes yeah. and and i don't even know if they should be making those jokes but yeah. it certainly can't be made uh, uh, in a sitcom where it feels like there's some element that's trying to ground it in reality yeah 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 it's a prime time sitcom it's, a, it's not yeah. a late night thing on comedy central like, exactly. but on the other hand this is cbs this yeah. is the network that put uh you know two and a half men on the air for a decade <laughs> huh? Well, Which you know what's interesting? Was all those jokes. You That's know what's the interesting? Whole thing. There mm. was this period in the 90s where there were a lot of these like sitcoms on CBS that were kind of like about wealthy people yeah. that were like pilled out and like, you know, <laughs> always had a martini, like Sybil comes to mind. Right. Mm. You know, like I, I loved Sybil as a kid. I was like a fan of that show. <laughs> who's, her, who's her daughter? Her daughter was Alicia somebody. Alicia Witt. Thank you. Yeah, and she played like a funny character. She was like her yeah. kind of like weird, like not goth, but like like her daughter was like very like offbeat and yeah, uh, yeah. And Christine Baranski was like iconic yeah. on that show because she played a, she yeah. played her her best friend who was always kind of drunk and always like she was like she was like the Ellie in that show. Like she was always yeah. kind of like drunk and sleeping around and but yes. but in a more subdued way like in a more like sophisticated snarky way 
Uh, she's very she's very funny on that show. Yeah, we should we well, should we should uh, we should cover that show. Yeah, I mean, but it's but the thing is, it doesn't really fit our canon, right? Like it doesn't. <laughs> it's forgotten. It, I guess it is a little bit forgotten. Maybe nobody we knows will what do Sybil, Sybil is. one of these days. Uh, because yeah, I I just like <laughs> the things I was a fan of as like a freaking eleven year old are so weird it was and on. random. It was on because it was on TV. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the like the line from Seinfeld. So why am I watching it? Because it's on it's TV. On TV. <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> That's that's how TV works, man. But yeah, that is why you're watching because it's on TV. Uh, I feel like I have nothing else to say. I mean, I think we hit all the. Uh, hmm. I'm just gonna ask this because I want one of you to explain this to me. The pilot episode ended with a joke, and for the first time, it's not that I didn't find the joke funny. I really didn't get it. Like I did not get it. So maybe one of you got it and can tell me this. It ended with a joke that closed the episode, turn off the lights when you're done. What? Yeah. What? No, but, but I mean, but what I, don't she rem- I, don't, I don't remember I don't that. Rem- turn off the lights when you're done. What is she saying? So, done what? S- not, doesn't, there's no explanation. I don't, yeah, but set it up. So, like, Brian okay. and I have clearly so, both forgotten the yeah, moment. Yeah, bo- it's been wiped the from my brain. The setup is. Okay. I watched this six whole hours ago, man. <laughs> you've got the three women. I'm yeah. sorry, I can't remember first names. Ellie Dot and, and Val. Val. Val is the the one who the, the friend yeah. from yes. college. Okay, yeah. the so outsider. So with the whole conflict being Ellie and Val not getting along, and Dot trying to like get them to get along because Val is going to be staying at her place mm-hmm. or whatever, and she just wants them to get along with each other and mm-hmm. like squash whatever beef they have or whatever. And then at the end of the episode, I guess like. Ellie and Val seem to be bonding or getting along mm-hmm. and and Dot is like leaving the room, leaving yeah. them and just makes some comment like turn off the lights when you're done as she like heads up to bed or whatever. But then it got a big laugh from the studio audience. And I was like, is that oh. a joke? What's the joke? I think I think it's I don't know I think that's a laugh track though so I wouldn't look in I wouldn't read oh, into it. Oh, it was an audience. It was definitely an audience, but I, they sweet they sweet they just tell them to laugh at the big moments. They that's it. all. Yeah, I, I feel like it's like. <laughs> what do you want them to do? Complain it, about but complain my point about is, how uh, their watch exploded but, and uh, <laughs> yeah, three hundred three hundred springs came out. Yeah, but the, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, but the line was staged mm. as this is the big joke that's closing the episode, and I was just like, what? It's just what fl- is the joke? Flat. I think it's just she's like she's almost like a mom talking to her teenage children. It's like turn the lights out when you're done horsing around or whenever. Okay, yeah. I I don't know. Some, I, yeah. I, it's yeah. I guess that's what but, it is. But this is this is my point with a lot of the it, a lot of punch ups needed to happen in this show because there's a lot of lines like that that are just kind of flat. It's like okay, it's sort of a joke. There are so many but times it's... where I was like, this is what the joke should be yeah. in my head, where yeah, I was yeah, like, yeah, I yeah. finished the joke better. But there were yeah. several times when. I'm watching and suddenly it's as if or the character Or is it like a a sex joke? Is it like a like oh you guys are getting along so well Maybe like, I don't know. you're going to get amorous I turn the lights think... out when you're done. I don't know. A character might as well have said insert joke here. I... Maybe there was a writer's strike going on and they mm-hmm. were not allowed to punch it up while they were shooting. <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> Uh, well. Um, I I don't know. I just think it's just not the fact that you have yeah. so many questions about it just yeah. proves that there is I mean, you the, know, the, it, it was just a little bit flat. There's just a little bit of the biggest thing I was craving, though, is like you have these two women who are the main characters. Yeah. One of them is a novelist and one of them's a publisher. Show me them doing their things. Yeah. Just just once. Just I mean, show me something. Yeah. I mean, I, I like... show me a book cover. Show her doing a reading at some I'm book sure signing. We got, I'm sure we're, I'm sure we got lots of that. I know. I, but in the pilot. I need it in the pilot. I well, need. Well, they talk about her books and like they make jokes about like you Give know me a book title. They did. There was like a whole sequence where, um, basically Ellie's describing some dramatic thing that happened in her life, and then Dot's like, "That was in your second novel." Blah blah blah. Like that's not no, your okay. life. And the whatever. whole first, the whole first scene is the recovery from their the book launch the night yeah. before. I know, but I well, I would have loved to see that. Right. 
but it's, show me the book but launch. But the, but the show is not about that. It's about everything else in their life. That's just set dressing. Well, you know? I know it's not about the the auth being an author and being a publisher, but it would be about the party that they go to for that. It yeah. would be about. But again, they like, probably had no money and I, couldn't film that scene. I know, but I'm just saying, like, I, that's what I wanted to see. Like when I read the premise of what yeah. the show's about, I was expecting. Yeah. Like I'm not expecting to see her at a typewriter writing the book. I yeah. was expecting her to see her at a book launch drinking champagne. Yeah. I mean, just sidebar, I've always been fascinated with that trope that uh the the novelist, the a romance novelist yeah. from that era, because that's such a specific figure. Well, it's a great there, character. There, that's what I there mean. There were so many of them back then in the 80s and 90s, these like larger than life. Like Harlequins y- shit. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but but not the Harlequin, Harlequin, you didn't you didn't Harlequin was their, that was them. You didn't get to, the writer didn't get the fame out of those. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. These are different. This is like Jackie Collins. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And like, this is uh, you know, like, Danielle Steele. Yeah, like yeah the, the there big, you go. The, the larger than life character who's yeah. a romance novelist. It's just such an interesting, uh, yeah. It's such an interesting trope. It's just yeah. endlessly like Jackie Collins. I, I had watched like a documentary about her like a while back. And she is such an interesting story because she's like Joan Collins' sister. So it's like two like over the top like women like from the 80s yeah. that were like kind of glamorous and kind of eccentric, but very successful. Yeah. It's like the kind of. You know, the kind of thing that doesn't exist anymore. Yeah. And it's- this is where I like the way that TV comedy has evolved because a lot of sitcoms from that era worked super well. Yeah. What, I, what I like about a show like Hacks is yeah. you have a character who's a stand up comedian and I get to see her on the road. I get to see her doing stand up. I get to see yeah. her writing because jokes. Because that's what this the show is. That that's, show is about. That's what that show is about. Yeah. But I just mean it's like, yeah. It's about that. The romance novelist. Because it's about two women from two different generations approaching right. this kind of work and writing comedy and being relevant. Like, I know. That's what the show is I about. Know. But just the fact that like you have a character who is interesting because of a thing they do. Yeah. And you get to see them do the thing. Instead of just yeah. in their living room talking about how they do that thing. Yeah. I mean, I agree with you. I mean, it's always more fun. and But it might also be more fun for you because you're a creative person, right? So you want to see the thing. I think I think people who do creative work crave yeah. seeing those characters do their creative sure, thing. Sure, yeah. Because we're so enmeshed with that in our own lives. Like our personal lives. And creative stuff has no boundaries. Right. Yeah. Like it's like, you know, so that's you're craving to see that because you can relate to it. Yeah. But it's not what most people can relate to, really. And like, I don't I know. Guess, yeah. But like isn't me. It, <laughs> is, isn't it funny, though, that like in the 90s, so many movies and TV shows featured people in like the New York publishing yeah. industry, like magazines, books, newspapers. Yeah. But Barry, if, Comic books. If, if there were a sitcom about you, you would be shown doing this podcast. Let's be honest. <laughs> I guess. <laughs> you would be shown at least occasionally in different episodes. I guess. Uh, maybe. I don't know. Oh, my gosh. Let's do like an episode where we all come up with what our, our different sitcoms would be. Like if there were a sitcom about. Well, Aaron and I, it's. <laughs> It's complicated because we wouldn't have separate sitcoms. Our sitcoms would just be. No, no, of course not. No. You know, it would be yeah. like the couple. And then, you know, you would have your own sitcom. Damn straight. It'd be Cat Dad. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Cordy would feature for sure. Yeah. I yeah. mean, the sitcom that closely parallels our, our lives is probably mad about you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, boy. Just saying. <laughs> Uh, but instead of a golden retriever, we have a little sassy calico cat. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But doesn't Paul Reiser like work in documentary or yeah, something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, yes, he does. And, and uh, Jamie works in like advertising, which is sort yeah. of an agile. <laughs> yeah. And what I do. The Jewish guy and the blonde woman living yeah. in a New York apartment. Well, We're look in a at downtown that. apartment. We're just the Buckmans, it turns out. The ages are about yeah. the same. Yeah. Brent. Bryn was in Twister. <laughs> yeah, I was in the movie <laughs> Twister. Not really everyone, but you know, I wish 
Actually, if you could have been, you could have been the young Helen Hunt, you know, at the beginning when uh, she like when her dad gets like, well, hey, no, <laughs> tornadoed away. No, seriously though, I was traumatized at a young age by a tornado. There so you go. So there is a parallel there because there was a tornado in my backyard as a child, and my dad was outside and we were worried about him the whole time but he lived to tell like he he did not get sucked up but he was outside in the midst of the tornado happening and we were all very upset about it and for years after i could not see a strong wind and not get full of anxiety so yeah Fair so, enough. Uh, apparently, yeah. Apparently, it just tracks that yeah. we're the mad about you couple. Also, I would want my show to live in the same world uh, as Seinfeld, but obviously, I don't think I'd play into being part of the Seinfeld story <laughs> world directly. Well, there'd be crossovers with Barry's sitcom. Yes. Yeah, when you guys were really like, or when I was really flagging and ratings. <laughs> We we like we like, like this hey, show is not reunite. this. Sh- yeah, let's start a we podcast don't know if this sh- with our yeah, friend we, Barry. <laughs> we don't know if this show is gonna even make to the. So you l- got a retool, half. okay? Yeah. So your your like original premise was just I wouldn't f- yeah. I wouldn't fly to audiences. They would they would be like, we got to figure something <laughs> out to do. Oh boy. Okay. So anyway, does this episode win the award for most tangents? Quite possibly. Probably. But you I guys, feel like you guys are both in tangent tangents. moods. Yeah, we are. We are. Did we take our ADHD medication today? I didn't. I so. did not. So there you go. Uh, <laughs> There's your answer. Barry. This uh, might be our longest episode, too. Yeah. OK. Good all, right, Lord. all right. All right. So six degrees of friends. Let's get into it. Let's get into okay. it. Are you guys dying to find out how it's connected to friends? Um, yes. I, I can't sleep at night without finding this out. <laughs> Okay. So connect us with friends. Right. So okay. So there's quite a few um, connections, like as you would assume, uh, given the cast and everything. So I have three different two degree connections fr- with between friends and Gene Smart. So basically, Gene Smart, who played Ellie in High Society, also co-starred in Sweet Home Alabama. With Reese Witherspoon. Reese Witherspoon guest starred on Friends. Mm-hmm. Gene mm-hmm. Smart. Uh, also, okay, so this one is kind of a loose one. I don't know if it counts, so you can tell me. That's what Six Degrees is for, man. Okay. You got six. No, 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 but you'll see why I, un- I, you know, it might not work. So Gene Smart had a recurring role in Frasier. Okay, so she played a Frasier, one of Frasier's girlfriends. Oh, I kind of vaguely yeah. remember that yeah, now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So... Um, Lisa Kudrow was the original Roz on Frasier. Mm. Mm, yeah. But she wasn't. But she wasn't. <laughs> That's why I said it doesn't quite work. But anyway. But we can but I mean like are but you telling me you up, can't but- are you telling me you can't get to Frasier uh from Frasier to Friends? Because we're already at Frasier. Yeah, but now I didn't put any more. I know, in there, but right? surely anyway, there's a non Lisa Kudrow connection. Be, yeah, there's going right. to be more. So that could be like a four or five degree connection or whatever. Yeah, so Gene Smart um, guest starred in the 2019 reboot season of Mad About You. <laughs> 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 Matt, and then um, Lisa Kudrow had a recurring role, as you guys know, in the seven original seasons of Mad About You as Ursula Buffay. <laughs> <laughs> did she not? Did, she, did they not get her back for the? No, they didn't for that 2019. Yeah. So Ursula Buffay was, of course, the twin sister of Miss Phoebe Buffay, also played by oh. Lisa Kudrow on Friends. Okay, and then so we have a couple through. We have a couple through Mary McDonald. So she co-starred in Donnie Darko. Yes, she did. With Jake Gyllenhaal. Jake Gyllenhaal starred in The Good Girl with Jennifer Aniston. And Jennifer yes, Aniston was, of course, Rachel Green and Friends. Oh. Mary McDonald <laughs> also co-starred in Scream 4 with Courtney Cox. <laughs> Courtney Cox was Monica in Friends. Uh, and then we have a one degree connection via Michael Lembeck, a legendary um, TV director. Right. He directed both series. And that's it. Yay. 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 All right. 
And uh, I guess we go to the spinoff. Yeah. So obviously, you know, just at first glance, obviously no one was hurting for work after this. Like it was like a very, you know, all the performers, like the whole cast went on to keep working. Um, Mary McDonnell continued to work steadily following high society. She did a lot more um, dramatic roles. Uh, she kind of became a TV movie icon for a stretch in the the like late 90s. She also co-starred in Battlestar Galactica as President Laura Roslin, um, season three of Fargo. And she also had a recurring role in Major Crimes. Um, notable movie roles, as I mentioned, Donnie Darko, Scream 4, and Margin Call. So she, yeah, she's had a very long and successful career. Uh, Faith Prince um, continued to work in TV as well. She's had a, like a lot of you know notable guest starring roles and recurring roles, including in Spin City, Huff, Drop Dead Diva, and Monarch. Um, Luigi um, Amadeo um, appeared in uh, many successful sitcoms as a guest star throughout the 90s and also was in the cast of The Bold and the Beautiful for several uh, seasons. Yeah, that, that tracks. Yeah, that tracks. Uh, Jane Meadows, um, basically, so she played Alice. Um, uh, mom. The mom of Dot. Uh, so she actually joined the cast of this show as a veteran actor. So she had been performing in film and TV since the 50s. So she mm -hmm. had already had a very long career. But following High Society, she still appeared in a few uh, TV shows and movies. Her last role was in um, the film Story of Us in 1999. And Oof. she passed away. Yeah, she <laughs> she passed away in 2015 at the age of 96. So Ooh. she had a very like long and storied career. She was like, you know, pretty much an icon. Uh, David Rash, uh, following High Society, he continued to appear in TV and films. The West Wing, Suddenly Susan, All My Children, Ugly Benny, Bored to Death, Veep, and most recently Succession. And basically in this household, I will never shut up about Carl in Succession. Like Aaron's probably sick of hearing about it. No, I like Carl. I think he's hilarious. Because I just think it's just such a perfect encapsulation of that like bland seat like executive type like he just nails it but he's he just, like such a perfectly put together scuzz bag that yeah, it's just it's just it's so perfect perfect it, it's like a master class like i feel like he studied these guys like these like ceo types yeah and like because it's just you know it's just like Perfect. And like he, it's very put together. Yeah. And even when on that show, in very tense moments where he's losing his shit, he does it in such a like polished, bland way. <laughs> yeah. Well, he's he has you know? yeah, but like in both shows, there's a similar body language that you can see yeah. and a similar kind of what what did I call it here? He he yeah. flips between he's like a corporate stooge and he flips smoothly between like level-headed bland type and like sarcastic yeah. and smarmy yeah but like he's able to just there is glide a, between there, them there is a beat and this is more this is not just giving flowers to david rash it's also giving flowers to the editors of succession there is like a cut and one of the episodes, and I can't describe it because it might be a bit of a spoiler for anyone who hasn't finished it, but there is like one just like cut to a shot of Carl that made me like lose my mind. Like I laughed so hard and Aaron was like, this is not even I'm like, no, it's just perfect. Like it's just it's like perfect <laughs> cut to him, like looking like bland and like <laughs> like it just, you know, the whole thing is just a like chef's kiss. Um <laughs> But yeah, and then last but not least, of course, we have Jean Smart, who, again, like I'm such a fangirl for um, after High Society, you know, she's appeared in so many different things uh, since the 90s. She's appeared or recurred in many popular TV shows. Notable TV roles include District, uh, The District 24. Uh, she did uh, a voice on Kim Possible. She had a role in Samantha Who, uh, Harry's Law, Fargo season two, which was like such an exceptional performance, like incredible. Um, 
the Legion, um, Mayor of East Town, another incredible performance. Um, and, oh yeah, she's good on Legion. I forgot about her. Yeah, and uh, she's also guys. I didn't know this. She's the voice of the Depression Kitty on Big Mouth. Yeah, oh. I knew. That. <laughs> yeah, and currently she's like killing it as Deborah Vance on Hacks. So yeah, hmm. keep keep being amazing, Jean Smart. Yeah. <laughs> well. It's that time again when we should uh, check in with our good pal, Mr. Producer. Oh, God. But why? It's the format. <laughs> oh, God. Hey, kid. Mr. Producer, I can, I can barely hear you. Are you at a party or something? A party? Or like on an island? Huh? Uh, uh, oh, uh, hold on a second. Uh, sorry about that. I was listening to one of my favorite albums, Best of the Island, Volume 4. You know, Mitch Stevens and the Staten Island Steel Drum Studs. The first three volumes, eh, they're not so great. But these guys really found the rhythm on Volume 4. Uh, I'll, uh, yeah, I'll have to check that out. It's a set, though. You gotta order them all. Oh, okay, so maybe, maybe not. You gotta order them all. It's a set. <laughs> I probably won't do that. You're really missing out. So, uh, what are we talking about this week? High society. You know, with- Oh, yeah, Gene Smart, one hell of a performer. Shop is a whip in that. McDonald, too. Yeah, great actors. Any insights on this one? <laughs> Actually, yes. I greenlit the damn thing. It was all based on a script I was working on with Matt Bopp and great American novelist John Updike. Hollywood went nuts for it. It got passed through every executive's office. People just had to read it. <laughs> Variety once called it horrifically confusing and woefully tone deaf. <laughs> Quite a review. Oh, sure was. Well, kid, I got another appointment with a daiquiri. Remember what I said, Mitch Stevens. Volume four, right? Yeah, but you have to buy them all. <laughs> it's a set. <laughs> got it. I actually had two leftovers. Oh, oh, uh, look at that. Barry's got yeah. some leftovers. So one, um, every episode starts with a, uh, by incorporating the title of the episode, uh, like a title card into the scene in some yep. way. So like, yep. uh, like it's on a napkin or, or in the beginning of the one it's on the case of jewels. Mm. I love that. I'm a sucker for title cards <laughs> and I'm I'm a huge sucker for incorporating them into uh into the scene and I never see it I love it. Uh my second one was honestly a, just a tremendous line and line reading uh from Mary McDonald that it was such a good line that I was like what is this doing in the show? Um and they were like uh, uh you know, El and Dot are fighting and Mary McDonald's all depressed and Dot's like, they're like, oh, well, you know, she, mom's depressed. And she goes, I'm not depressed. I'm deeply introspective with a slight dramatic flair. <laughs> yeah, that is a great line. Oh, yeah. man. Yeah, that is. That's a that's great. How, that's great. That's yeah. a, but I missed that's it just, at the time. That's how I describe my depression now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, I, I missed that line at the time. I think uh, this show did not hold 100% of my attention. Yeah, yeah. Didn't and deserve Didn't deserve. Yeah. Didn't deserve it. Because you know what it is? It's like some of these shows hold my attention because I'm genuinely entertained. Yeah. And some of these shows hold my attention because I'm ironically entertained. This one was like not good enough to be good, but not bad enough to be bad for me. It was just sort of right down the middle yeah. of just like, I kind of guess where they're going with this. It's kind of a big wave, Dave's. It, it, it's a real, <laughs> yeah. it's a real CBS sitcom. It's is a what real it is. big wave, Dave's. <laughs> Don't say that. This is gonna curse this episode. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but people won't know that I made that comment unless they've listened this long. Yeah, so. they'll, there you go. They'll, they'll feel it. <laughs> they'll feel, feel it. it. They'll, they'll feel, feel it. the energy. It's got yeah. a, a big, big wave, Dave energy. <laughs> yeah. B B W D, <laughs> real B W D energy. 
<laughs> yeah. Barry is what? not amused. I uh, no, just because I'm having flashbacks. <laughs> <laughs> I was just remembering like well, that that fucking awful scene where they're all up in the wife's bedroom and they're trying to convince her to like that we had to move to Hawaii, and I was just like, <laughs> "What is this?" Yeah, that was terrible, and she's just like. Ah, fine. We'll move to Hawaii. And I remember just being so sad for this character that she's yeah. been thrown. She her her life has been ruined by these men. Yeah, just these numbskulls <laughs> that she has to go along with. Oh, all right. So we well. put too much of Big Wave Dave in there. <laughs> now we're really jinxing it. On that note, guys. Beep up. You gotta buy the set, Aaron! The set! That Was a Show is created and hosted by Bryn Burney, Andrew Barry Helmer, and myself, Aaron Yeager. It's a production of Radio Gizmo in Toronto, Canada. Subscribe, rate, review, and share. Follow us on Instagram and tell your friends about it. That Was a Show... Radio Gizmo.